Nine tips and tricks, here we go. When you start a new canvas, there are two important things to consider. The pixel dimensions for both width and height, as well as this setting, which Photoshop calls resolution. It's the amount of pixels per inch. Commonly, this is shortened to PPI, pixels per inch, or DPI, dots per inch. Now, the more important of the two here is the pixel dimensions. The amount of pixels determines how much data your canvas can hold. A 720 by 480 pixel canvas is fairly small by today's standards. A 1920 by 1080 pixel image is what you see on most HD screens. And an image at 3840 by 2160 is what you're looking at on 4K displays. Okay, if you're making art for digital viewing only, pixels are all you have to worry about. The DPI or PPI is irrelevant. Here's a digital painting. Let's go check the pixels and DPI on it. All right, our pixels are 1100 width by 879 height, and our DPI slash PPI is 72. Let's do a little experiment. I'm gonna uncheck the resample box, which locks the pixels in place so I can't change them. And now I'm gonna change the DPI to something crazy like 3000. Now you might think my computer will explode when I hit okay, but nothing happens. My computer monitor is only reading those pixels, which despite the hike in DPI have not changed. Okay, so what does DPI even do then? Well, DPI matters when you're printing. Let's say we want to do an eight inch by 10 inch print. First, we need to tell the printer how many dots or pixels it should use to populate each inch of the paper. For the sake of simple math, let's set our DPI to 100. And here's a little ruler dividing our width into eight segments. Because we're printing at 100 DPI, the printer will use 100 pixels from our image to fill each consecutive inch. The math here is easy. We're using 100 pixels per inch multiplied by eight inches. This canvas would need to be 800 pixels wide. And for the height, it's just 100 pixels per inch times 10 inches. This canvas would need to be 1,000 pixels tall. Photoshop can do this math for you, of course. If I go to File, New, change this over to inches, and set my destination print size to eight by 10, and change my resolution or DPI or PPI to 100, hit OK. I get my file and now we'll go back into image size and look at it in pixels, we can see that our math checks out. Now, for professional quality, you'll want to print at 300 DPI. So that same eight inch by 10 inch print at 300 DPI, the width is 300 times eight, which equals 2,400 pixels, and the height would be 300 times 10, which equals 3,000 pixels. It's helpful to know how this works to avoid basic pitfalls. For instance, if I go to File New, switch this to inches, and I want a nine by 12 print, and I hit okay, and then spend hours painting some Iron Giant fan art. Great, now I can get my nine by 12 print, right? Well, not so fast. Did you catch the mistake I made? When I created that canvas, I accepted the default value of 72 DPI. And if I went to image size here, you can see I was actually painting with very few pixels. And if I wanted to print this at 300 DPI, well, I would be getting a pitifully small print. Now, let me show you one last thing. I'll switch this back to 72. You can brute force this and have Photoshop give you a nine by 12 print at 300 DPI. I'll click on the resample button. Now I'll change this to 300 DPI, hit okay. And Photoshop adds the pixel data necessary to achieve this. However, it does so indiscriminately, and the painting looks soft and fuzzy and pixelated and generally awful, and it will print that way too. So I don't recommend doing this. What I do recommend is that you keep your output in mind whenever you make a new canvas. A little information goes a long way. Here's a piece I'm working on, and I'd like to check my values as I work. My old method was to make a new layer, set that layer to color mode, and then go and grab a pure white color or black, it doesn't matter, and fill that in. Then what I could do is name this layer black and white, lock it down so I can't paint over it, and now I have an instant layer on the top that toggles between black and white and color. And that works, but what happens when you have a lot of layers and you're working on a layer say way down here and you wanna see your image in black and white? Well, you have to stop painting, scroll all the way up just to click this on and then maybe all the way back down to see your layers beneath here. So here's a more user-friendly way to do this. It starts with a handy little shortcut. Push Control or Command Y, and notice that little readout at the top of your image changes when you do that. 
What Photoshop is doing here is it's previewing your image in a different color space. And currently that color space is set to the default of CMYK. You access that here, view, proof setup, and of course CMYK is checked. But if I just go into custom and pull down this menu, I can have Photoshop access any of these. Now, I don't know what most of these do, to be honest, but the option that gives you a great black and white preview is this one up here, working gray dot gain 20%. Click that, click okay. And now you can see our readout here has changed accordingly. If I push control Y and disable it, it goes back to normal. And now we don't need our black and white layer anymore. Let me trash that. So now when I push control Y, I get a black and white preview. It's eliminated scrolling and made my workflow more efficient. And there's even one more cool thing you can do. Let me just move my layers over. Go up to Window, Arrange, and go all the way to the bottom, New Window for your file name. Photoshop makes a new window, but this is not a copy, it's an instance. So let me just quickly rearrange my workspace here. All right, here's the original painting on the left and our instance on the right. When I put a brush stroke down on the original, it updates over here. Now I'll go into the instance and push Control Y on it. So it becomes a live updating black and white replica of my original. If you have dual monitors, throw this guy on that second monitor so you can see it without obstructing your main interface. Pretty cool. When you're in the color picker window, clicking around and choosing your colors, you may have noticed that when you venture to certain areas, this exclamation mark shows up. You know, it's there now, it's not there now, it's there now. What's the deal with that? This is relevant to printing again. When the exclamation icon is there, it means you're out of gamut for printing. That is, a printer is not likely able to reproduce that color. And the cool thing about this is, let's say I'm like way off up here, and Photoshop is telling me, hey, the printer's not gonna be able to do that. I can simply click on this color, and Photoshop brings me back to the nearest print safe color. And while that's a nice feature, it is a bit tedious and non-intuitive. So check this out. Push Control Shift Y. And now we have this out of gamut map or a print safe map. And you'll notice as I change the color, the print safe map changes along with it. And that's right, certain colors are easier to reproduce in print than others. If you're only interested in displaying your work digitally, you know, monitors, phones, tablets, TVs, this is much less important because most of those devices will be able to display a full palette. All right, I use layer masks almost every single day. Let's start with a brief overview. I have a layer with a red circle and a layer above with a blue circle. Because these are just normal layers, they are 100% opaque. With a layer mask, you can assign custom transparency. You create a layer mask with this button here. And when I click it, you see it created a kind of a layer within a layer. I'll do the same thing for layer two. Layer masks operate behind the scenes, separate from the layer's visible content. And I can click back and forth and select either the layer mask or the visible layer content itself. Layer masks are grayscale images where white is 100% opaque and black is 100% transparent. So just to show you how it works, I'll click into layer two's layer mask. I'll grab an airbrush and I'll just use my tablet pressure to brush this in. And you can see what happens. Also notice the layer mask has updated. In fact, if I alt click into the mask, I can see my actual layer mask painting. Again, white being opaque, so we see the blue circle in these areas, and gray to black being levels of transparency. To get out of this, just regular click back in the layer content. All right, I've gone ahead and reset my layer masks here, and how I usually work with them is I have a layer on top that I want to subtly reveal, and instead of starting with 100% opacity, I like to build up opacity. So with the layer mask selected, I'll push Control I, which inverted the image to black, making it 100% transparent. So in effect, this layer is doing nothing. Then I'll go grab a brush. And just for the sake of this demonstration, let's grab this funny brush right here and then switch my color to white. And I can begin painting with this cool texture brush revealing my blue circle layer. And this is the best part about layer masks. I can use any brush I have to paint into them. Layer masks are also non-destructive, meaning my blue circle data is always there. So no matter where I am in my painting process, if I want more of that blue circle, I can paint it in. If I want less of it, I can paint it out. And you'll see me using layer masks in some of the upcoming segments in this video. Here's a matte painting that I spent a long time on for a film project. The director likes the landscape, but now wants the color palette to be more like a warm sunset. Now, I'm obviously not going to repaint this from scratch. So what I've done here is I've loaded up some old paintings of mine and thrown them in the layer stack. These are just various paintings I've done in the past that have different color palettes. 
Now, with my main painting layer active, I'll go up to Image Adjustments Match Color, and I get this dialog box. The first thing you want to do is set your source to the PSD file that I have open here. And now we have access to all the layers corresponding with my layers in the stack. And if I click through these, it applies their palettes to my painting. I find this one here really does a nice job with the light areas of the mountains, and maybe layer two does a better job in some of the shadow and foreground areas. I also still like some of the properties of my original. By the way, you also get some nice sliders here to help you fine tune the effect. Okay, so I've gone ahead and done the effect a few different times and arranged them here as layers. And to combine them, I'll use the layer masks tip from the previous section. I'll give each of these layers a layer mask, pushing control I on each of them to invert them so these layers don't show through at all. And here I'm speeding through the process of painting into those layer masks and making a composite image. In a moment, I'll duplicate my original, put it on top just to bring it back in some subtle ways. So you can achieve a dramatic palette change in just a few minutes. Now, I probably wouldn't use this as a final painting, but it's a great jump start. If I wanted to move in this direction, I would flatten my image and just continue on from here. Thanks to Photoshop's relatively new quick selection tool, isolating elements of photographs has never been easier. To pull a mat from this, I just press Ctrl J and it puts the selection on a new layer. That's simple enough, but what happens when we want to isolate something more complex, like this plume of water? Photoshop's selection tools, as smart as they are, simply don't know where that water is. After all, that isn't a solid object, and it has multiple levels of transparency. So we will need to apply some human intelligence to pull this mat. The first thing I'll do is make a new layer, and then I'll go find a brush that might mimic the transparency and shape of that water, maybe this one here. And then with that brush on that layer, I'll pick any color. I happen to have this red color selected. I'll go ahead and paint something that approximates both the shape and various transparencies of that water. I'm pushing harder on my stylus for more opacity, softer for less. I can layer brush strokes to build opacity, and I can use multiple brushes to best mimic this thing. The top of this plume looks like it has some motion blur on it, so I could even approximate that by selecting this area, feathering it out a touch, then going up into motion blur and dialing that in. Once I'm happy with what I've painted, I'll control click the layer, which selects the layer transparency. And with that information active, I'll go back to my original layer, push control J, and bear with me while I hide these layers in order to show you that I have isolated our plume of water pretty effectively. Sometimes the effect is a little soft. You can always duplicate the layer and modify its opacity to taste, merge it down when you're finished. And if you have some unwanted elements like this little bit here, I can always give it a layer mask, grab an airbrush set to black and just paint it away. This is a great technique for photo bashing or matte painting. I also think it's superior to Photoshop's quick mask mode, mainly because of the ease of a dedicated selection layer here, which you can edit or otherwise go back to at any time. Sometimes you'll be sitting here sketching away and you zoom out and look at your entire image and you notice that your color is a bit off. In this case, the palette is overall reading a bit too red. Or maybe you're just bored of your colors and need a jolt of inspiration. So one thing I like to do is duplicate the layer and simply go up to Image Auto Tone. And Photoshop tries to achieve some kind of overall color balance, I suppose. Now, I like some of that, but not all of it. So I'll enlist our old friend, the layer mask, Start by inverting it so nothing shows through. Then using a soft brush set to white, I reveal the parts that I like. And comparing the before and after, I think this is an improvement. So I'll push Ctrl E, merge those two layers and keep painting from here. Here's another little trick for adding subtle color varieties. This one works especially well on bright scenes like this morning scene here. Make a new layer, fill it with black, set it to screen mode, and then go up to filter, render, lens flare. Now let's do a quick estimate of where the sun is. It doesn't have to be accurate. Hit OK. And now scale, rotate, and position it in place. Now we can press Control U and bring up hue saturation and just color correct this so it fits a little bit better in the scene. Now it still looks like a terrible lens flare, but here's where the subtlety comes in. Go to filter, blur, motion blur, and spend a few seconds dialing this in. Now go ahead and grab that layer mask, Control I to invert, and paint it into your heart's content. And there we go. No one will ever know that started as a cheesy lens flare, except me. We've already discussed how canvases can have different pixel sizes. 
And because this is a digital environment, it makes sense that brushes act the same way. Photoshop indicates the brush's size in pixels with these numbers. A brush's resolution is set when it's created. So this brush that I have active here is 261 pixels, which means that when used at its full size, it will repeat itself every 261 pixels. Digital brushes are like stamps that get pressed over and over. And that's the root of an overall aesthetic challenge we all face with the digital medium. To demonstrate how this impacts your painting, I've got two different sized canvases loaded up here. The first canvas is 700 pixels wide, so the brush only has to repeat a few times to get across it. This canvas, however, is 3000 pixels wide, so that same brush at that same size has to repeat many more times to get across. And when I look at this one, I can really detect the repetition, whereas the first one feels more organic to me. Now, you could simply raise your brush size to a similar size relative to the canvas and paint with that, but the problem now is that brush is at a much higher resolution than it was designed for, and it's prone to looking soft and digital as a result. So the dilemma is this. I would like to paint at a lower resolution to benefit my brushwork, but I often want my final to be high resolution. So what I like to do is start with a canvas at a fairly moderate size and paint with that for a while, then I go into image size and add some pixels to it. And I continue my painting with that and simply repeat the process as many times as you'd like. Photoshop actually does a pretty decent job with this, let's call it iterative up resing. And doing this keeps my brushes happy for the most part and also keeps my CPU happy. And that in turn keeps me happy. Okay, last one. Here's an illustration I did for a recent book project. As usual, I painted this in RGB color space, but the publisher needed me to submit it in CMYK color space. In a perfect world, you could just click that, click don't merge, and now my painting is in CMYK. But did you see what happened there? I'll go before and after. Look at all the color changes that happened in the CMYK conversion. This problem can be exacerbated by layers set to things other than normal mode. You see these yellow color-coded layers? This one's on overlay mode, this one's on linear dodge mode, this one's on overlay again, and I have a bunch down here set to screen and linear dodge. The CMYK color space is a little less accommodating of those, which is why I paint in RGB. Now I could just go layer, flatten image, then convert that to CMYK, and it's a pretty good match. But this is no solution because I've lost the layers and the publisher wants those layers intact. The solution is to bake our layers so every layer is on normal mode, and then do the conversion. Let's look at these upper layers here. These are all characters, and they're affected by this lighting layer set to overlay mode that's lending a kind of ambient rim light, also some subsurface scattering on the mouse's ears there. So what I have to do is apply or bake this layer's effect to all the layers that it comes in contact with. In this case, not only all the characters, but also the background. If I zoom in and turn this layer on and off, you notice it's also influencing the background. The first thing I'll do is bring up the history window, click that button and make a copy of my file because I'm about to do some serious surgery to it. Now I'll count all the layers that this layer has an impact on. One, two, three, four, five character layers, plus this character layer is six, plus a background is seven. So I'll need seven copies of this layer. Now I'll position each of those copies above one of the layers it affects. Obviously all the copies of this layer have magnified the lighting effect. The solve for that is take each layer, right click on it and say, create clipping mask. You'll get this little arrow icon indicating that this layer only influences the layer beneath it. I'll do the same for every layer I just copied. The background doesn't need one, it's at the bottom. Now all I have to do is click on each base layer, like the character in this case, push control E and it consolidates it. So I'll do that for all these guys. And for the background, I'll just click this one and push control E, which merges it down. Now, if I isolated one of those layers like this mouse, you can see that the subsurface scattering effect we looked at earlier is now baked into the layer, removing the original overlay layer entirely. I went ahead and applied that process to all the appropriate layers and we're left with a nice clean layer stack. This is also beneficial because now the client can't mess with my lighting effects. They're baked right in there. And of course the last step, image, mode, CMYK, don't merge, and we have our nice ready for print final. Well, that wraps up nine tips and tricks. I hope some of them were new to you. There's lots more where that came from. Thanks as always to my generous patrons. You guys are the best. If you're new to my channel, check my archives for more complete painting lessons. And I'll see you in another video.